Hey church family, my name is Emmanuel, and we just want to fill you in on some information before we get started. As you know, we are now having services on Sunday in church, and for now, Wednesdays will still be online. We hope you enjoyed today's service and want to give you a quick tips on how you can still worship God through giving. Here are the ways you can still give. The first way is online at covelifechurch.org. You can still give in person by coming to our church office between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. Lastly, you can send your tithe through mail at P.O. Box 2650, Corona, California, 92878. As a reminder, a couple ways you can get here is through the links on Facebook, Instagram, or website at cuplifechurch.org. We want to thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about our online services. Let's go ahead and get started with our praise and worship. Every wall comes crashing down I have 
have the authority Jesus has given me and when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated by the power of your name. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Cause you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated by the power of your name. I'm seated in the heavenly undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Good evening Covenant Life and welcome to Wednesday Night Refuel. We're getting ready to get into the Word of God. Why don't you open your Bibles with us to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 and then we're going to look at Hebrews 10 and 24. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today to partake of the bread of life, the living manna. And we ask, Lord, that you would take this word, may it become milk to the milk drinker, bread to the bread eater, meat to the meat eater. Adjust this message to us, to wherever we're at and wherever we live. In advance, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Reading from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, Although I hope to come to you before long, I am writing these instructions to you so that if you are, so if I am detained, you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God or in the household of God. And then he goes on to describe what the household of God or the church of God is which is the church of the living God. Notice the pillar, this is from the Amplified, the pillar and stay and the prop and the support of the truth. And then over there in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, in verse 25, it reads, And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as we see the day approaching. I want to share with you today a message entitled, Poor Benefits of Having a Church Family. Benefits of Having a Church Family. We're all aware of what happened to us in, in COVID-19 lockdowns and the stay-at-home orders that were issued. And as that happened, all of a sudden, everybody fell into one or two categories. Essential or non-essential. Businesses and services that were deemed essential were kept open. Businesses and services that were deemed non-essential, we had to close. Here's what was deemed essential. Supermarkets, hardware stores, 
gas stations. You remember. Pet stores. Liquor stores. Marijuana dispensaries. Laundry mats. And so forth. Many others were deemed non-essentials. We were ordered to close down until further notice. It was businesses like this or operations like these. Gyms, movie theaters, salons, casinos, restaurants, sporting events, concert venues, and then, of course, the Church of the Living God fell in this category. And you know, uh, we went ahead and obliged services, church services obliged, and we were wondering and, and, and wanting, wanted to protect people from the spread and the contact of, of this virus. And, uh, but few challenged the church gatherings as non-essentials. They didn't challenge, very few challenged it. And I'm talking about the per perception of what it says about the value of the church and the church in society. It sent a message. Here's the message that it sent. Church is nice. It's nice to have, but in no way necessary. Church is nice to have, like a luxury. We can live without it for long seasons. And some today consider themselves church alumni. By that I mean they used to go. They graduated. They're alumni of the church. But churches have been labeled are now, it's beginning to turn. But, uh, you know, the question is not, is the government considering the church essential? Now, the question is, are believers considering the church essential? Are believers saying, man, God made the church. The church was designed created by the living God. Wait a minute. We need, we need the things that the church supplies. We need everything that God supplies in the church. The question now is not, is the government consider us essential? The question now is, are believers now considering the church essential? Because in some cases, it's the believers now that have cited and said, church is not essential. Church is a luxury. You can go to it when you like. You can skip it when you want. It's a luxury, but it's not really necessary in daily life. How far from the thinking decades ago when churches were considered to be the pillar of truth. Churches were considered to be what functioned, what made society function and got everything straight in life. You know, the big, the big social justice thing in the 60s was all based on the church. Martin Luther King, the, the churches protesting, the blacks protesting, the African Americans protesting, but notice, protested in nonviolence, protested holding hands, singing hymns. It was the church that influenced. It was the church, the pillar and rock of the truth that things were done. And now the government says, oh, by the way, churches are not essential. But the question is, what do you say? The question is, what do believers say? Are we saying today, no, churches are essential. I want to share with you four truths today. And uh, we're talking about uh, four benefits of having a church family. I'd like to look at four benefits today because sometimes the believers need to stop and look at the benefits of the home church. Number one, a church family helps me focus on God. Or we could say worship. Number two, a church family helps me face life's problems. Or we could say Fellowship. Number three, a church family helps me fortify my faith, or we could say growth. And number four, a church family helps me to find my 
function in life, or we could say purpose. Let's get into it today. Number one, a church family helps me to focus on God. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 38. It's a command Jesus tells us. It talks about the greatest and first command. It says, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and your mind. This is the first and great commandment. i got news for you. This cannot be done without a home church. You know, uh, why is it that to love God is the most important commandment? Because we were made to love God. We were made to fellowship with him. We were made to worship him. And God made me, and he knows me, and, in, and he loves me, and in turn, he wants me to love him back. The Bible calls that worship. And worship gives us a greater percep perception of God. You know, when we worship the Lord, the Lord becomes bigger. Our problems become smaller. When we worship the Lord, His might becomes powerful, and the things that we face are not as powerful anymore. And there is a tremendous power in corporate anointing. There's a tremendous power of coming in the, in the presence of the living God, in the midst of the tabernacle of the upright, wherever two or more are gathered in my name. It's, a, it's totally different. The corporate anointing is totally different than what you do at your house with your CD player, with your iPad, iPod, whatever it is, and you're worshiping God. To be in the corporate anointing is a whole different notch above. It's a whole different realm. The, the psalm is in, uh, in Psalm chapter 34 and verse 3. Wonderfully says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. They, they made songs out of that psalm. You know, and, and, and it's a whole different arena, a whole different phase that we go into when we magnify the Lord in the corporate anointing. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever find yourself distracted? Do you find it easy to be distracted? You know, it's not hard to lose our spiritual focus. It really isn't. You know, uh, the book of James tells us in chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, that we can even forget the kind of person we are. You know, you know what I'm saying? Some people walk with Jesus. Some people walk with Jesus, but they go on vacation. And they're in another country. And all of a sudden, they forget that they walk with Jesus. They go on vacation, and they're away from their home and away from their natural realm. And they forget what it's like of being a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm just trying to tell you, sometimes we can go ahead and, and lose our focus the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 tells us that pleasures can go ahead and distract us. We're talking about sometimes we can be distracted. And so we're talking about the fact that having a church, a wonderful church relationship with God, a wonderful relationship with our church helps us to focus on the living God when we feel like getting distracted. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. It talks to us about a man named Demas. And it says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved, the apostle Paul said, having loved this present world and has departed to Thessalonica. Yeah, sometimes we get into the pleasures of life and can forget God. You know, sometimes we can get distracted just by work. Just by work. I mean, the, the grind of life, the nine to five, the whatever your hours are, and just get to work, to work, to work, to work. And sometimes we can get distracted by God. Listen to the account of uh, the, the gospel of Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 20. Notice it says, and then he told this story, that a farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. And he talked to himself saying, what can I do? My barns, my barn isn't big enough. For all this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. 
I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns and then I'll gather all my grain and all my goods and I'll say to myself, so, you've done well. You've got it made. Oh, now you can retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then, God showed up and said, Pool, tonight you die and your barns of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barns with self and not with God. We're talking about we can be distracted. Coming to church, being having a church family helps us focus on the living God. Hey, what else can distract us? How about worries? The problems of life. Luke chapter 21, the gospel of Luke 21 and 35. It reads, take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and notice, and the cares of life. i tell you, the cares of life want to attack all of us. You know, the cares of life, the duties of life, the, of whatever season you are in right now. You're single, but you're the cares of life of getting married. You're married, but the cares of life of having children and providing for them and having the insurance and having the things and the school. You, you got children, and now you're, they're getting older and becoming teenagers, and what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? And so forth. You got Children, they're now leaving the home, and where will their life be? The cares of this world and the cares of this life, they want to attack us no matter what phase we are in. It says, and the cares of life, so that that day come upon you unaware. You know what? We're talking about the worries of life, but life itself can just be a distraction. People can get distracted from good things in life. But let me tell you something. Don't get, get, get distracted in life from the high life. Don't get distracted in life from the best life that God is offering you and me today. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, it, verses 16 through 20, it talks about a, a, a rich man, a great man, having a wonderful feast being prepared. And he went ahead and prepared this feast. And all of a sudden, he says, it's ready. Let's invite everybody in. Let's bring him in. And they went ahead and invited everybody, come on in. But Jesus, in verses 16, said, and Jesus said to them, a man gave a big, gave a big banquet and invited many people. And when it was time to eat, the man sent his servants to tell them, the guests, come on in. Everything is ready. But all the guests began to make excuses. The first one said, I have bought a field, and I must go look at it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five pairs of oxen, and I must go try them out. Please excuse me. A third said, I just got married. I can't come. Life itself can distract us. We have children now. Let me tell you about when you say, we have children now. Yeah, and they're watching you. And your children are watching you. And your children are watching as to what's, what you do. And your children are watching as to what's your priorities. What you think is important in life. Get yourself in a good home church. Get yourself in church and let your kids follow you and move forward together. You know, so we're talking about the fact that we can get distracted. And so here is what God has done to help us. Because we're talking about worshiping God. Because we can get distracted. The first commandment, thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. And you got to get in a good home church. you got to get in church so you can do that. So here's what, what the God has done, the Lord God has done. He gave ten big commandments. And in one of the big commandments, he basically says this. Every seventh day, refocus. You going to walk with me? Every seventh day. Refocus. Come and worship me. Come and honor me. Come and fellowship together. You know, come and put me first place every seventh day. My church family helps me stay focused on God. When we worship, it gives a better perspective of our problems because we get a better perspective on God. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
And let us exalt his name together. The first purpose of the church is to focus on God. We say worship. The second, number two, a church family helps me to face life's problems. We call that fellowship. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, it says, He died for us that whether we are awake in this life or asleep in death, we live together with him. Therefore, verse 11, encourage each other and strengthen one another as you are doing. The message paraphrase of that says, he died for us, a death that triggered life, whether we're awake with the living or asleep with the dead, we're alive with him. So speak encouraging words to one another and build up and build up hope so you'll all be together in this. No one left out. No one left behind. I, knew you're, I know you're already doing this. Just keep it up. Hey, I don't have to tell you, life is tough. And uh, we're all tempted to get discouraged, each one of us in our own circumstances, in our own situations, in our own battles, in our own trials. But God never meant for me to go through that all by myself. He gave me, and he tells me to be involved with a church family. And he planned for us to have a church family for support. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 says, And now this word to all of you, you should be like one family, full of sympathy toward each other, loving each other with tender hearts and humble hearts and humble minds. We're supposed to encourage one another. We come to church. We get encouraged by one another. You know, sometimes I'm just encouraged by certain people's presence. You know, we have some real seniors. Hey, I got to I got to admit, I'm a senior now, you know. And, uh, but there's some real seniors <laughs> above me there. And I look at them, and they're in their 70s, some in their 80s. And I see them walk into church, and it blesses my heart, and it encourages me that look at, they're at their phase in life, and they're still putting God right in the center of their life. Every seventh day, they refocus and get back on track. Set their life again in order. Set their life again in place to be able to move on this marathon and move on this hall and continue to be faithful to the Lord God Almighty. We're to encourage each other. Encourage each other even as the scripture says, even as the day approaches. On Sundays, we're talking about the second coming. On Sundays, we're talking about the rapture. And it says, as we see these days approaching, we got to encourage each other. Brother, don't give up now. Brother, stay on track. Sister, don't get discouraged. Don't let go. The, the Lord is good. His word is true. We're going to encourage each other. Hey, the big day we don't know it may could be, could be around the corner. We're to encourage each other to continue to walk in love. Nobody but the Bible and nobody but the family of God is encouraging you and I to walk in love. It, it's a dog eat dog world out there. They're encouraging you to, I wouldn't keep, I wouldn't put up with that. I wouldn't let them say that about me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. The only thing that's encouraged you to say, give it to God. Let it go. Walk in love. Judgment is mine, saith the Lord. You don't got to defend yourself. Hey, is the church of the living God. And we come and encourage each other to continue to walk in love. We come to encourage each other to continue to be a, a blessing to others. To continue to use our finances, our resources to be a blessing 
to others, as we're a blessing to other ministries, we're a blessing to other people. To this day, we're being a blessing to other ministries, being a blessing to other people, and to continue to do that, that God will go ahead and meet our needs, that God will go ahead and do for us, that as we cast our bread upon the water, in many days it comes back, and encourage others to be a blessing, encourage others to plant their lives as a seed, Keep on doing the will of God, brother. Keep on doing the will of God, sister. It's like a seed that goes down into the earth. Sometimes you feel like you just died. But you know what? Fruit comes out. Growth comes out. God's will comes out. Encourage one another. Encourage one another to keep moving forward every day. Forward every day. Forward every day. Somebody say, how you doing, Pastor? I said, I'm moving forward. Anyway, any place but backwards, I got to go forward. I got to go forward in the name of Jesus, encouraging others to stay away against, against the things, the tricks of sin. Oh, let me tell you something. The devil is sly. The devil is subtle. And we need to encourage each other. And we endeavor to encourage each other. Don't go for the fried ice cream, brother. Don't fall for the fried ice cream, sister. You know what? That ain't God. Let it go. That ain't God. Move along. Hey, hey stay, stay with the word. Stay with the word. Don't let sin deceive you encouragement. Whatever we're going through, you feel like giving up, don't give up, brother. God is faithful. God will come through. He'll do it again. All we're saying is we weren't meant to go through things by ourselves. God provided us a place for fellowship to strengthen one another. We encourage each other. Listen to me. Encourage each other in the battle. Don't focus on the cape. Focus on the Matador, using a bull fighting illustration. The bull don't know who the enemy is. The bull thinks the cape is the enemy, but it's the matador playing games on him with a sword stuck inside that cape, ready to, at the right angle, stick that sword into that bull. And so many times we're messing with the cape. You know, we think that People are our problem. That individuals are our problem. Our relatives are our problem. Our, some people in church are our problem. And the scripture says, our wrestle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. My time is moving fast. All we're saying is this. The Christian life is not a solo act. You know, somebody told me a little illustration about fellowship and staying in church and, 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 and looking at the church of the living God as essential. He went ahead and told me like this. He said, you know, you know, Jess, you're like a little coal. He said, you ever, you ever did a barbecue? I said, yeah, all the time. Those are the days before the coals and before the <laughs> lights went off there. This was the days before gas-powered uh, barbecues. We all did charcoal. We all did the coals. And, and he says, you're one of those little coals. And if you get into the barbecue there, into the pit or whatever it is, and you stay among the coals, the coals give heat to one another, and good things take place. He said, if we'll take one of those little coals and put it on the side by itself, the first thing that will happen is that coal will begin to cool off by itself. And that's what happens to believers. They stop coming to church. They stop fellowshiping with believers. And all of a sudden, they don't realize how cool they become. In some cases, how cold they become. But I got good news for you. You can take that coal that's become cold and you can put it right back in, in the midst of the warmth of the rest of the coals. In a very short time, it'll be giving heat. In the very short time, it'll be warming up by its, on, with, with the others. In other words, the second purpose of the church is for fellowship. Number three, the church family helps me fortify my faith. That means growth. Hebrews 6 and 1a from the New Living Translation let us not stop going over the basic teachings. Let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. And, and let us instead become mature in our understanding. You know, as a pastor, many times I'm asked two questions, a twofold question. It goes something like this. 
How do I know God's will for my life? And how do I know what God wants me to do? And I tell them the first thing that God wants you to do is that he wants you to grow up spiritually. And you know what? It is really impossible to grow up spiritually without connecting to the church. It's impossible. Let me tell you something about connecting to the church. If you cannot connect with the church and live out the principles of the living God and the word of God in church, if you can't live them out in church, I got news for you. You don't live them anywhere. You don't live them out anywhere. Because in church is where it's the most easiest place to live out the principles of God and the word of God. It's the easiest place. And some people have trouble doing it here. Don't tell me you're doing it someplace else or you can't do it here. Because everybody has got the mindset of Christ here. Everybody is trying to put their best foot forward in Christ. Everybody's trying to live as they're instructed by the word of God when they come in the building. And if you can't flow with the people in the building, don't tell me you're living the word of God out there. I guarantee you, you are not. But the scripture tells us there's newborn babes. As newborn babes, longing for milk, the unadulterated spiritual milk, which is to help you grow up into salvation. How do we grow up? We learn to get into the book and then learn to apply the book. It fortifies our faith. You know, the word fortify, it reminds me of uh, all these cereals that are nothing but sugar. But uh, they want to sell them to you to give them to your kids because they do something. They say, fortified with vitamin C. Fortified with vitamin A. So they get this sugar and they spray a little bit of vitamin C on it or a little bit of vitamin A and now they've taken this junk food, so to speak, and they turn it into a nutritious meal. They say that because they say it's fortified. It's strengthened. Something has been reinforced in that sugar cereal that now makes it nutritious with certain vitamins. My church family reinforces my faith. My church family reinforces my value. A fellowship with my family reinforces, helps me to clear up my priorities. Come on. Do we get challenged with our priorities? We absolutely do. But thank God for our church family that helps us to be able to figure out what's true, what's right. What do I really believe in? You know, my church family helps me to develop character, conviction, and integrity. I do it right here in the church of God. Make commitments, make verbal commitments that I got to keep to people that I got to talk to truth and stay, say the truth to people that give me the truth. It's the easiest place to do it. You can't do it here. You don't do it out there. How do we grow spiritually? Somebody would say, here's how it basically happens. We get the word of God into our mind. Here's where we get the word of God into our mind. Along with the times you spend at home, right here, we do it together. We get the word of God into our mind. And then the word of God goes into our heart as it first goes into our mind. And as it goes into our heart, then the Word of God will eventually get into our attitudes. If you put it in your mind, it'll go in your heart, and all of a sudden, then you'll start having biblical attitudes. It goes further. After you start having biblical attitudes, then you'll start doing the Word of God and practice the Word of God daily. All of a sudden, daily you're checking yourself. All of a sudden, daily you're checking your attitudes. All of a sudden, this thing starts affecting you daily because it went in your mind, then in your heart, then in your attitudes, and now it begins to be seen in your daily life. And then we'll become living Bibles. Wow. We'll become living Bibles. We'll go ahead and become a walking Bible as Sometimes it's the only Bible anybody will ever read is watching your life. We become 
a living Bible to be read of all people. And then it will be obvious what, we'll be, what we were created for. It will be obvious to us what our purpose will be. You know, um, the third purpose of the church is to help me fortify and develop my faith. Let's go to the last one, number four. A church family helps me to find my function and my purpose. You know, God put us on this earth, and he put us on this earth not just to take up space, to say I am one of 7.5 billion people that are here. God expects me to do something. God expects me to do something back, to give back and be a contribution in this life. That's why he's given us gifts, talents, and abilities. When we use our gifts, we call this ministry. Let me tell you something. God wants to go ahead and help me to find my function and my purpose. And God wants me to start by obeying him and let him use me. Think about this as we close shortly here in a second, actually in a few minutes. I want you to consider the fact that God wants to use you. And he himself determined at least these five things. Check it out. God determined the timing in which you were born. You realize you weren't born in the 1700s. You weren't born in the time when the Mayflower came. You weren't born in the time of the Civil War. You weren't born even in the 19, early 1900s. Most of us were born past the mid-1900s. But God determined that. God, God's hand was upon us. Yeah, the scripture says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, and born under the law, Galatians 4, 4. And when the fullness of time was come, God put you and me to be born in what we believe are the last generations. We're born at the end. But you know what? God put us here during this time because he wanted to use us because he knew you'd stand up because you'd know you, you, you'd, you'd stand up and be counted. You were born in this time and God determined the time you were going to be born. God also determined the where you would be born. He determined your location. He determined your culture. Romans chapter 1 and 1 the Apostle Paul wrote, For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And God determined where he was born, the location, and the culture. You know, I don't know where you were born, but you're here. You're here in the USA. You might have been born someplace else, but you are here in the USA. You know, and more particularly, listen, if you're watching our program, most likely you're from California. My, 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 that crazy place, this world called California. Let me tell you something. God has used this crazy place called California before, and he's about to use it again. God used this place to bring in the Holy Spirit and the Azusa Street revivals in the early 1900s. It was from California that, that things went out. God used the second awakening to hit this country from the beaches of Newport Beach and out there and the hippies that came and started this, this, this revolution that has gone on throughout the whole country and in some places the whole world where hippies were getting saved and the Calvary Chapel movement was birthed and all these other churches were birthed and all and then God did great things right here in California drug addicts and dope fiends got saved here in California and things that spread let me tell you something California, then California got crazy now we got crazy the other way but now some of us that God determined that we would be here. We're getting crazy again in the right way for California. You know, the word, it, it says that, that as California goes, so goes America. And as America goes, the world follows. And from California, the greatest moves are taking place now. 
where people are rising up, where people are saying enough is enough, where people are saying let God be God and Jesus be Lord over our lives, over our churches, over our counties. And it's happening right here in California. And some of you are, those of you that are, most of you that are watching me today, they're talking about you. We have a few people from, that watch us from Indiana. God bless you out there. But right here we are. God determined the location and our culture. And then God determined the family we would be born, which determined our DNA. He determined that Jeronimo Reyes would be my father, and Enriqueta Reyes would be my mother. And I got their genes, and I got their DNA. And my brothers and sisters all got their genes and their DNA from them. And God determined that. Somebody said, you don't pick your family. You don't pick your family. But God picked your family. And determined the, the things that are running through you that go through, come from your father and come from your mother were to be used of God to accomplish his will, his plan, and his purpose. Then he, re, then he determined our order. Some of us are the oldest in the family. Some of us and, and, and things that, pressures that are placed on the oldest. Some of us are in the middle of the family. In the middle of the family, they got to fight for everything. And then some others are the, the babies of the family. And God determined that. And then sometimes God reversed the order. And the babies of the family were all servants. I was a baby for a long time. Before my sister came along. And it was go to the store, pick me up, do this. Clean my room. Do that. Do that. You're the baby of the family. Go get the ball. Do this. Do that. But then sometimes God reversed the order. We see it in the Bible where the elder served the younger. And then he determined our gender. And our country is gender confused. But he determined our gender as a man and a woman. And the things and the strengths that go with the man. The things and strengths that go with the woman, all because he wanted you and me to have a purpose on this earth. And I'm beautifully made, and I fit the purpose of God, but I don't fit trying to do my own thing. I don't fit that. But God wants to use me, and God wants to use you. We're talking about a home church and the value of having a home church. We're talking about the government says you're not essential. But I'm asking you today, believer, do you believe that the church is essential? Because whatever you believe is what really matters, not what the government believes. Let me pray with you today. It's time to come back to church. It's time to get into the church building again. It's time to say, I need the church because God said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's relevant. It's pertinent. It's essential. I believe it. I think you believe it. Let's get back into church. Some of you, you've never been into church. Let me lead you before the throne of grace. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the holy name of Jesus. I ask you, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Place me in the body of Christ. Help me to become a part of a wonderful and strong local church that I may fulfill the plan of God in my life. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. In behalf of Pastor Sandy and myself, thank you for joining us on Wednesday Night Reveal. God bless you. We'll see you soon.
of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Of your voice you have led me through the fire in darkness night you have closed like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend yeah I have lived in the goodness of God and All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God As your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything As your goodness is running after It's running after me As your goodness is running after It's running after me As your goodness is running after It's running after me with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything, yeah. As your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Again, thank you for logging in with us today, and we hope you can join us this Sunday in church at 10 a.m. for Sunday morning service. We pray that you have a blessed week, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.